solutions for the second problem set on structure determination problems. Most of these compounds have a carbonyl compound since we started uh, looking at that group. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now one of the things that we need when we do structure problems if we have proton NMR is a proton chemical shift table so that we can make some guesses. Uh, take a look at this. We've talked about this in class. Look at all these protons down here with the very wide ranges. Uh, that's these red protons. All of these are highlighted in red. These are all exchangeable hydrogens, so they have a very wide range of chemical shifts depending on their particular environment and the solvents at the time because they're exchangeable. Because we're doing a lot of carbonyls problems, we're going to be interested in these compounds that have carbonyls. Uh, protons that are on the alpha carbon, that is the carbon next to a carbonyl group, typically come somewhere between about 2 and maybe as far out as 2.8, 2.9 ppms. Uh, the other thing we're going to be looking at is the esters. Uh, notice that these esters, they typically come very far out. Oops, sorry, that's ethers. Do we have esters? Uh, here we go. Here's our esters right here. Esters come out, you know, somewhere around four. Uh, so that's where we expect esters to come. And then our aliphatic alkanes, you know, somewhere between one, two uh, out here, our aromatic region somewhere between you know 6.8 and 8.1 uh, aromatic protons aldehyde protons come way out at 10 carboxylic acids even past that the nice thing is there's not much out here so these when we see signals out here they're very uh, conclusive that we probably have an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid so let's go ahead and take a look at our problems the first one was to uh, construct some spectra and it, for these three compounds. Each of these compounds will give three signals on a proton NMR. Uh, each of these has an isolated methyl group that is a methyl group that will give a singlet and they also have methyl group or I'm sorry ethyl groups. An ethyl group has a CH2 bonded to a CH3. So we expect to see the pattern, which is uh, a quartet and a triplet. But where they appear is different. So here I've drawn some facsimiles of the spectra. Our first one, which is just two butanone. We expect the isolated methyl group to be a singlet uh, right around somewhere around two. I've drawn it just past there. I don't know. I'm constructing this from tables, so I'm guessing. Uh, my CH2 group I expect to be my quartet and it's also on an alpha carbon so I expect it to be somewhere around two. Methylene groups, that CH2 groups, come a little bit further upfield than methyl groups so I've drawn it to the left of the methyl group. And finally our, our methyl group uh, which we expect to be a triplet is going to be down here by one. Now notice in fact all of the methyl groups are going to come somewhere around the same place. In this particular compound, we now have an ester. So the carbon that's bonded to the ester is the CH2 group, which is going to be a quartet, and we expect it to be somewhere around four. So I've drawn a quartet out there around four. On this met compound, we have an isolated methyl group that's bonded to the oxygen. So I've drawn a singlet way out here at four and there's our CH2 that's on the alpha carbon that's right here. Uh, in this case the CH2 is oops the CH2 was bonded directly to the oxygen sorry and the CH3 groups all come out here somewhere around one. Uh, so you should be able to construct a reasonable facsimile. Now these could go left or right uh, you know, half a ppm without being too concerning. Uh, what I would want to see is that you are able to figure out the multiplicity and have some idea where they would land. The next problem is similar. In this case, we're just asked to assign our uh, 
protons to the signals in the spectrum. So in this particular case, uh, the way I do this is I've just labeled all of the protons from A to G. I've labeled them in such a way that I'm going to start at the furthest upfield. But let's start at A. A is an aldehydic proton. We've already said we expect it to come way out here. There we go. There's A. We have some symmetry here. So we have two sets of equivalent protons, B and C. They're next to each other. They're going to couple with each other. Uh, so we expect these to be doublets. And they're going to be in the aromatic region. Here they are right here, B and C. Uh, I wouldn't be too concerned if you didn't know which one was which, um, but the fact that you can tell that they're doublets tells you that you have this uh, aromatic proton. Four protons in the aromatic region tells us we have a parasubstituted aromatic group. Uh, as it turns out, B will be the furthest up uh, downfield and C will be less downfield. The next one we're going to take a look at is D. Uh, D, we expect to be somewhere around 4, and we expect it to be a triplet because it only has two protons on the carbon next to it. And here we can see that we have this triplet out at uh, right around 4. Oops. So that's D. Then we just go on to E. E, we expect to be a multiplet. Uh, and F, we expect to be a multiplet. Potentially, there's one, two, three, four protons on each side of it. If the coupling constants between E and D are pretty well equal to the coupling constants for E, F, then we expect this to be kind of a pentad, and that's what we see here, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, it's not the best spectrum, but that's what we get. There's E, and F is next to it, and finally G, we expect to be furthest upfield. We expect it to be a triplet. Uh, and we expect it to integrate for three protons, and there we go, G. So it's helpful to assign protons and get used to where we find them. The next problem we're given may seem slightly hard because we weren't given any indication as to molecular formula, uh, atomic mass, I'm sorry, molecular mass. All we were given is an IR, and on the next slide you'll see we were given a proton NMR. Take a look at the IR, and what we see is an absorption at 1740. If we take a look at our table for the IR absorption of functional groups containing a carbonyl group, uh, we take a look, and at 1740, we see aldehydes, and we see esters. Anything else in there at 1740? Uh, acids, not so much. Uh, so we probably have an aldehyde or an ester. But the other thing we know about aldehydes is they have these two CH stretches in the 2820 and 2720 regions. That's right around here. And we don't see those. They're usually prominent peaks for aldehydes, and we don't see them right there. Uh, so we're fairly confident we don't have an aldehyde. We probably have an ester. Let's take a look at the NMR. Uh, we see the integrations, and again, let's keep things simple. If we see something integrate for two, the first thing we should think of is a CH2 group. It doesn't have to be a CH2 group that's there. It could be two CH groups that, through symmetry, integrate for two protons. But most of the time, as I say, let's keep things simple, and we probably have CH2 groups. We also have two signals here. Looks like two triplets that integrate for three each. So let's keep it simple. Think of those as CH3 groups. And remember, we had an ester. Now, all we have to do is hook these up. There's a couple of ways you could hook them up, but let's explain the coupling. So this is coming way out at four. We expect this CH2 group, if we have an ester, this CH2 group is bonded directly to the oxygen. And it's a quartet, so it would have a CH3 group bonded on one, the other side of it. So it's bonded to an oxygen on one side and a CH3 on the other. So we've solved one side of our uh, ester. We've solved this side. There's an ethyl group there. It's probably 
this group and this group. On the other side, we have our quartet triplet pattern for an ethyl group. So we probably have an ethyl group on the other side. And if we take a look at what is responsible for this spectrum, we have uh, ethyl propionate, and we can explain all of these absorptions in both the IR spectrum and the proton NMR spectrum. Let's move on to problem three. Problem three, a uh, little tricky here because it's not a carbonyl containing group, although you, you knew that, I didn't tell you that they were all carbonyl containing groups. Uh, the little man is yelling something at us here, okay? He's telling us take a look at these two peaks. We see uh, peaks, one is due to the molecular ion, I've told you that, and one is due to the M plus two molecular ion. So there's a three to one ratio here, roughly, we can tell that by looking at, that's very indicative of chlorine. He's yelling at us here, he's saying, hey, look at this 127. We often see uh, an iodine peak at 127. If we think we have iodine, the other place we might take a look is at the M minus 127. In this case, there's a big absorption there, M minus 127. That's also usually a prominent peak in compounds containing an iodine atom. Other thing that's interesting, if we look at that, these two peaks are M minus 127 and our M plus 2 minus 127, that means that the chlorine is still attached to whatever fragment is responsible here. Probably just lost to the iodine. So it seems very likely that whatever our compound is, it has a chlorine and it has an iodine and it has a molecular mass of 204 or 206, depending which, uh, which isotope of chlorine uh, we do our calculations with. Okay, we, we have it solved here, but here's the NMR spectrum. Again, we keep things simple. In this case, although it says two, it's two to two to two. This could be CH groups, CH3 groups, or uh, CH2 groups. Uh, how do we know it's CH2 groups? We don't, uh, but we have some other evidence. Over here, we have a triplet. That means whatever this signal is, it has, it is attached to carbons and has two protons that it's coupling with. So it could very easily be a CH2 that's coupling with another CH2. Could be this one or this one. The same with this. And our other peak, our final peak has one, two, three, four, five. There's something there and it's not very symmetrical. I'm a little worried about that, but this is uh, consistent with a CH2 group that's in between two other CH2 groups. And this structure is com completely consistent with the data we've been given. Problem four, we are given the molecular formula. And what's the first thing we should do when we have the molecular formula? Let's calculate the unsaturation number. And in this instance, we have uh, an unsaturation number of two. We have three oxygens. So right away, I'm gonna take a look over in the region that would tell me if I had a uh, carbonyls. And I see big absorptions there at 1716 and at 1745. So it's very possible that I have uh, a ketone and an ester. Again, I don't see anything here, so I don't think I have an aldehyde. Uh, so this is consistent with two carbonyls. There's two uh, absorption peaks in the IR. So uh, I'm going to be drawing these and, and taking a look if they're consistent with the NMR pattern that we're going to see. Oh, look at this NMR, it's full of signals. But let's keep things simple. Let's assume that anything that integrates for CH2, for two is a CH2, and anything that integrates for three is a CH3. 
Now let's count our carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. We also have a carbonyl and an ester, seven, eight carbons. How about our protons? Three, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Okay, so this is looking promising. Now all we have to do is hook those up. I suppose they could hook up in any fashion. How are we gonna figure this out? Well, if we take a look, we see that uh, we have something way out here past four. So if we have an ester, this CH2 is probably bonded to the ester. And what is bonded to that CH2? It looks like one, two, three, four, whatever's bonded to it is making it a quartet. So it looks like it's bonded to an ethyl group. So we've actually solved one side. This explains, there's our peak at 4.3. That's a quartet, and this thing over here uh, splits that. We expect this to be a triplet somewhere. I'm gonna guess it's this one. So we've used this fragment, this fragment, and our ester fragment. Let's now to construct this so we could get rid of them. Now all we have to do is figure out what's going on on the other side. So we see a peak out here at two and a half, Okay, that's not, that's in the region for protons that are on the alpha carbon of a carbonyl. So this could be bonded to the carbonyl group. Then we see something here, a CH2 that has one, two, three, four, five, six. So whatever this is, it's coupling with five protons. There's two on this side and there's three on this side. So it could, it could be bonded to this and bonded to the methyl group on the other side. Uh, so let's get, we see that we have this carbonyl group in here. Now, oh, that should have disappeared too. Oops. The only things we, we have, we've constructed a fragment on this side. We've got to connect it to something. We've constructed a fragment on this side. We have one isolated CH2 group left. So we could stick it in between these two and we end up with this spectrum here. And this is completely consistent with both the proton NMR and the IR. And it really wasn't that hard, even though it looked like it's gonna be hard, it wasn't that hard as long as we were slow, methodical, and logical. Problem five, uh, well, we're not given a lot of information but we are given a molecular formula that tells us, oops, I've made a mistake. That should not be U equals two. That should be U equals one. C4H8O, an unsaturation number of one. So we have an unsaturation number of one. What do we have in the NMR spectrum? Well, we have a peak for one proton out here, 2.4, 2.5. It's expanded here. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven peaks that seem to be split into a doublet. Okay, what's this? This, you can't see it, but it integrates for about six. You can just barely see it, 5.93. So we have probably two methyl groups, and here we have uh, a methine, that means one, a CH group. This pattern, Hopefully we're starting to recognize that is an isopropyl group. It's very common to see this. Now, this sometimes gets split in further if there's any protons on whatever it's bonded to, but in this case, it doesn't appear. We also have a peak way out here past nine, and we know that the only thing that comes out there are aldehydes, okay? So if we take a look, we have C4, we have one, two, three, four, H8, 3, 6, 7, 8, and our oxygen. So that's the only two fragments we have. We just have to click them together. Uh, and this explains that spectrum. Finally, our last problem is another assign the peaks problem. Assign the signals to the structure. So uh, I'll take a different approach here. I'm just going to 
take a look. I'm going to take a look. Where do we expect the aldehyde to come? Somewhere out approaching 9. We don't have anything at 9, but we do have this thing at 8. Okay, so this thing isn't quite an aldehyde because there's this oxygen here. So maybe it comes at a slightly different peak. But that's the only one that would explain it. So I'm going to assign that proton to this signal. Notice, too, it integrates for 1. I'm now going to take a look at this CH2 group bonded to an oxygen. I expect it to be somewhere around 4. I take a look. There's something at 4. It integrates for about 2 hydrogens. It's a nice triplet. Look at that. It's, it's, it's a triplet. Kind of messy, but that's okay. This is an unusual compound. I'm going to assign it there. The next CH2 group, I expect this CH2 group to be a multiplet because it has two on one side, three on the other side, it might be uh, a multiplet of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. There's a multiplet of six. That's this one way down here. It integrates for two protons, which is exactly what we expect. So I'm going to assign it there. Then we only have one assignment left. We're going to make the assignment because there's only one left. And then we're going to see if it makes sense. So it's a CH3 group next to a CH2 group. We expect it to be way down here at 1, and we expect it to be a triplet. So this is also consistent. There we go. That's it.